All right, everybody, let's go. Get up, because it's time to start. This is Sandra. show y'all we are so excited to have you here on today's show do you know what today is What's today? do you know what today is I'll see what you did there. it's wednesday <laughs> y'all give it up listen we are so delighted to have you and i just want y'all to take a moment and say hello to the band yeah. hey. What's up? What's up? on drums we got the one and only mr jonathan parks luke Dabo, yeah. hailing from haiti a brand new episode ah. of the Sassandra Show. I'm your host, Sassandra, and I couldn't be more thrilled to kick off this fresh new day with all of you. Yeah. To my incredible TSS tribe, welcome back. Yeah. You are the heart and soul of this show, and I am so grateful for your consistent love and support. And to all our new viewers, we are just delighted to have y'all. Yep. Thank you for joining. So whether you're seeking inspiration, a little laughter, or just a place to feel connected, you've come to the right place. Today, we've got an incredible lineup that will entertain, inspire, and empower you. So get all comfy, yeah. grab your bubbly grab beverage, uh -oh. and let's get this show started. Let's get it started. Woo! Yeah. Do y'all know what time it is? What time is it? It ain't offering time, y'all. <laughs> it's tea time! Come on, we're gonna serve this thing up hot and piping. Are you ready to sip and spill? So, breaking news from Israel. The country's top court has issued a landmark ruling that will change a policy in place for decades. Ultra-Orthodox Jewish seminary students who have long been exempt from military service will now be required to join the military draft. Didn't we just hear this over here too? Didn't they just yeah. pass a law where yes. all of our kids now from 18, whatever has to be in, enlisted in the military? So this decision comes after, not enlisted, let me correct, because I know y'all uh -huh. gonna be talking noise. Not enlisted, but they have to be registered or something like Somebody that for it, yes. Yeah. So this decision comes after years of heated debate and legal challenges surrounding the issue of military exemptions for religious students. Yeah, the court's ruling aims to ensure equality in the burden of military service, which is mandatory for most Israeli citizens. That's deep. That's yes. very deep. So, everybody gotta go. I see it doesn't matter on. what you believe, who you believe in, you gotta go and fight for your country. I will tell you, growing up, my mom always told me, if the draft ever comes back, we are getting on that plane and going right back to Trinidad. <laughs> always, always. Back to the Caribbean. She's always told me that. Really? <laughs> yes. It's interesting. It's very, very interesting. I mean, we are patriots. We love our country. That goes without, you know, without saying. But at the same time, it's so hard to think about war. Yeah. Mm. All right, let's move on to this next story. Y'all, you're not going to believe this. This is extremely sad. A wealthy West Virginia couple, I'm going to say their names, uh -huh. Donald Ray Lance and Jean K. Whitefeather, have been charged with human trafficking, forced labor, and child neglect of their five adopted black children. The children aged 6 to 16 were found in absolutely deplorable conditions, with some locked in a shed and forced to work on the couple's farm. The couple has pleaded not guilty, and their bond has been set at half a million dollars each. The trial is set for September 9th. We will be tuned in. Let's move on. Mm. Next. 
because I can't even believe this is going on exactly. in this day and age. Do y'all want to talk about it a little bit? Oh, not even. Because this is uh, crazy. We don't got nothing good boys. to say if you want to. I, can y'all find something good to say about this, audience? Do y'all? There is nothing good to say about this. No. So we just hope that justice will do its thing. Yes. Right. yes. Yes. All right. So we're moving on. Douglas County probate judge Christina Peter Peterson has been charged with simple battery against a police officer at a Peachtree Street lounge. This incident adds to her existing ethics charges from uh -oh. 2022, which led the Judicial Qualifications Commission to recommend her removal from the bench. She ain't learned nothing, did she? No. <laughs> the Georgia Supreme Court upheld this recommendation on Tuesday, unrelated to her recent arrest. Peterson, elect, she was elected in 2020, faced numerous ethics violations, including misuse of social media. Y'all need to stay tuned for more updates on this developing story. Yes. What? <laughs> What's nowhere? What is the judge doing? It's peach tree something, so I know it's in Georgia. In Georgia. I that know sounds in like Atlanta. Atlanta, right? I know that's in Atlanta. <laughs> Atlanta, Peachtree Street is Come like on. everything, right? We found you, but what the heck? I don't know. This is crazy. Fighting the police, like. <sighs> and she's a judge. But you know what? Uh -huh. I saw something on social media the other day. A, a, an officer pulled over a woman who was like a district attorney or something like mm -hmm. that. And she looked at him like, uh, what are you doing? Do you know who I am? He got it all on the recording. It was absolutely crazy. So she ended up getting charged for what she said because she was like, I'm going to call your supervisor. And he was like, ma'am, you can call whoever you want. <laughs> but right now, I just need you to give me your that's driver's a, license that's how and said all it. of this. So people think they're above the law when they get these positions like, you no. shouldn't bother me. No, listen, when you have those positions, you are held to a higher standard right. and you have to comply and be a role model. You can't be doing all this craziness, y'all. Exactly. If you don't want to do it, then don't get in public office. That's what I say. Mm. Mm. So, all right, y'all, it's time to chit chat. Yeah. Today, we have a truly inspiring guest with us. She has faced challenges that would stagger many of us, including navigating her mother's incarceration, becoming a teen mom, and overcoming homelessness and domestic violence. Yet from these trials, she has emerged not just resilient, but as a beacon of hope and empowerment in her community. Y'all, please welcome out Nakenya Stokes. <laughs> Here, smiling, bubbly, <laughs> looking fabulous. You do Thank not you. look like what you've been through. Listen. What Thank a mighty you. God we serve. Yes. Indeed we do. Yes. So let's start from the beginning, if you don't mind, of your childhood trauma. Okay, so can you share? The, she's like, okay, I'm going to tell you okay. everything right now. <laughs> Please share with us the circumstances that led to your mother going to prison. So I was about three years old. Mm. Um, we were in Arcadia, Florida, because that's where I'm originally from, mm -hmm. Arcadia, Florida. I know where Arcadia is. Yes, mm -hmm. the country town. Yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so my mom ended up going to prison, mm. and at the time, her sister moved to Polk County, Lakeland. She moved to Lakeland, Florida, um, and she came back to get me. Mm. So she came back to get me from Arcadia, and then she brought me to Lakeland. Mm -hmm. um, in that, my aunt was a big-time gambler. Mm. So she would leave me at different people's homes. While she, she went to go gamble? While she went to go gamble. Oh, wow. I'm sorry. So I would be at different people's homes that I didn't know. And how old were you then? I was around about three, four. Still? Oh, wow. Yeah, three, four years old, going to different people's homes that I didn't know about. And then sexual abuse began to happen while I was at different residents, just going I'm so sorry. back and forth. Yeah, thank you. I'm thank so you. Sorry. Um, so that's how the childhood trauma crept in in the beginning mm. of my life your story. Being incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So how did your mother's imprisonment affect your day-to-day -day life and responsibilities as a young child? So I had to raise myself. I remember being in the first grade and mm -hmm. my aunt would go to work early in the morning. I would have to wake up, get myself dressed. At five years old? At five years old. Wow. At five years old. I had that responsibility. 
I would get up. And you showed up to school. I showed up to school. Oh, you real good. <laughs> you are really good. I was always academically progressive. I was really? always, always shine academically growing up um, because that was my outlet. Mm -hmm. I loved education. Show everybody how smart yes. you are. Yes. yes that I was my it. outlet. So that's what, what, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Wow. So can you tell us what were some of the biggest emotional and practical challenges you faced after your mother went to prison? The abandonment. Just feeling the feel, Feeling abandoned. Feeling like I wasn't enough. Mm. Feeling like I had to turn to men that gave me attention. Mm. So Was your father anywhere around? No. My mom actually doesn't know who my father is. To this day? To this day. You don't know who he is. Right. Wow. Right. So That's she so. had a lineup of different men. So mm -hmm. as I grew up, she would take me to different men's house. Like when she would come and visit me in Lakeland. Um, she would take me to different people's houses and she would say, hey, you know, this is your dad. And it was about two different men that I thought were my dad. It was a Jamaican guy and it was another guy that I thought was my dad growing up. So Really? Yes, so you never got a blood test done? Never got a blood test. Nothing like that? Never got a blood test done. So in that, daddy issues crept in. I was going to say. So I'm dealing with both tough. spectrums. Yes. <laughs> Mom's gone. You don't know who your dad is. Yes. So you have father is daddy issues, as yes. they call it. Yes. How do you deal with the daddy issues to this day, not knowing who your dad is? So with that, I didn't grow up in a traditional setting mm -hmm, like mm -hmm, most people mm -hmm. have. But I remember being in a neighborhood and it was this bus that used to come to bus kids to go to church. Mm -hmm. So when I was probably about eight, nine years old, um, that's when I learned about who Christ was. Really? Yes. I love it. <laughs> now let me say this to you. We're going to take a short break, but we're going to come back and we're going to talk about when you discovered who Christ yes. is. Yes. Y'all, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back for the culture.
Welcome back to the Sassandra Show. When we went to break, I'm sitting here talking to Nakania Stokes, and she was telling us at the age of eight, around eight or nine years old, that's when she was introduced to God. Now, y'all look at her, she looked pretty, she's beautiful, she's brilliant, right? Y'all, come on, she's all of those things. Let me tell you something, she does not look like what she has gone through. We're gonna continue this story. It is definitely a miracle. So you were introduced to God around eight or nine years old. Tell us more. So around about eight or nine years old, they would bus and they would go to like these little camps that mm -hmm. they would have for like the inner city kids. Yes. So they would tell, tell us about Jesus and I'm like, okay, who is Jesus? But then mm. there was an image of Jesus that didn't resemble me. Mm. So mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to rock with that. I feel you, I feel you, I feel you. I wasn't trying to rock with that. So um, I went my own way. Mm. I went my own way. Um, in high school, I ended up getting pregnant. Mm. I got pregnant when I was in the ninth grade. Wow. Um, I had my son and then after that, I got pregnant again before leaving out of high school. Same, same person, I got pregnant by the same person um, and went through a lot of domestic abuse. In the with that same person? With the same person. Oh my goodness. That I had two children with, yes. Oh my God. Yes. Was he in high school as well? He was in high school, but he was a senior and I was a freshman when we met. Oh wow. So yes ma'am. And so he was abusive. Yes. And you got, how did you do school <laughs> with two babies? Yes, so because I loved school, I made sure that I, that. yes, <laughs> I love school. I was just always that person that made sure I was studying, making sure that I was doing everything I need to do in school. So after that, um, I ended up leaving him because mm. of the domestic violence mm -hmm. relationship. My youngest son actually went to school and he told his teacher that his mom got cut in the face. Ooh. And what you see that that didn't happen, but DCF, it started, it yep. started that cycle. So DCF ended up coming to my house and I said, they told me that my children would be taken care, taken away from me mm -hmm. if I don't leave the relationship. So I left the relationship because I'm like, I'm not I'm doing so this anymore. I'm so glad you chose the children. You yes. know, some women would not have chose the children. Yes. So I'm so <laughs> grateful that you chose to be with your children. Would you please share with us the circumstances surrounding the domestic violence you experienced? How did it start and how did you cope emotionally in high school with two children and homework and a man that is treating you not like the queen? You were, I, or you are. I coped with, um, I would self-medicate. Mm. So I would take a lot of sleeping pills. What um, are sleeping pills that a teenager can get? A yeah, they were in the were house. You, really? <laughs> so you were getting some, an adult yes. pills. I'm almost speechless at this <laughs> yes, point. Yes. Okay, so you're self-medicating. Yes, self-medicating, um, suicidal attempts. Temps. I'm so sorry. I used to try to cut myself. Um, just anything to numb the pain, I would drink because it was I had access to alcohol as in well. In the house. In the house. Mm -hmm. so Girl, I would if you drink. go to my house to this day, you won't find not one little drop <laughs> alcohol. I got a 17-year-old at home. It's just like this. Yes. You just don't know. You just don't know. If I'm going to buy it, I'm going to go buy it, and then it's going to be gone. Listen. When, it, when it, we it, buy it, it ain't yes. standing. Ain't so I feel you on that. So you had access to pills and, and alcohol and... Yeah, so that's not, that's what I did. I self-medicated. Um, just to deal with it. Just to deal with it. And in that, I knew it was a God, but I didn't know how to identify him. Mm. I didn't know how to identify him, so I would pray. Didn't know who I was praying to. Wow. I've always had a prayer life, but didn't know who I was praying to. Wow. Um, so I would just pray to God for doors to be open. Um, in that, my mom did get clean. Um, yes! Yes! <laughs> Can we give mama yes. some Yes. Yes. Thank yes, you, good. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. My mom did get clean and she ended up coming back into my life and helping me with my children. Really? Yes. That's such a beautiful story. Yes. Don't you love happy endings? <laughs> my goodness. Nobody yes. but God can do that. Nobody I'm but so God. glad. Uh, my sister preached this message about being introduced to God, meeting him, being introduced and knowing him. Yes. It's stages it's in this thing. Yes. So I'm so glad that you clarified that. No, I didn't know him then mm -hmm. I was introduced to him mm -hmm. and as you got older you got to know him yes ma'am now did your mom believe as well yes she yes did. yes I love it yes now you were talking about the figure that you saw in church and you was like I couldn't identify with that <laughs> so they to me when I see pictures like mm -hmm. that it shows me that people aren't really reading the Bible when they make 
images right. of, of, of Jesus. Right. Right. So when I went to my new church that I've been there for about 10, 14 okay. years, I looked up, child, <laughs> and I was like, oh, Jesus looked like me. <laughs> they had painted Jesus the color he's supposed to be at a predominantly white yeah, church. Y'all better yeah. go to First Baptist Orlando. When I tell you, that's why I be up in there. I'll be like, Pastor David, y'all got it right. Because I can identify. I can identify who I'm worshiping to. So how did the experience of homelessness come about for you? What were the events or factors that led to you losing your stable housing? So when my mom came back into my life, my mom as well, going through an abusive relationship mm. as well. So we end up leaving Florida and we went to Georgia. Mm -hmm. When we came back to Florida, we was homeless. We were homeless, we were sleeping um, at different hotels, we would sleep on people's floors. Mm. Um, so it was just a cycle. Mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm. just a cycle. And in that, my mom ended up getting employment, and then we ended up getting, you know, a small, a small, like, two-bedroom house. Mm -hmm. We end up living together. That's good. Yes. That's yes, wonderful. Yes, That's wonderful. What is it like living with mama? Um, I don't live with her anymore. When you, li <laughs> when you lived with your mama, how was that? Oh, God. It was very dysfunctional. Really? It was very dysfunctional because we didn't know each other. Mm. So you got two strangers. Mm -hmm. Don't know anything about our temperaments are the same. Not growing around, not growing up around her, our temperaments are really... We're you both, realize how much we you're alike. We go zero to a hundred yes. real quick. Yes. So our temperaments were the same and we would argue all the time. We would fight all the time. Mm. Um, I even fought my mom before. Physically? Physically. Stop it. Yes. yes. Why? Yes. I forgot what the situation Did was. Did you start it? No. She, <laughs> she started I mean, there's it. never a good reason, reason to touch your mama <laughs> or a mom to beat a child or if it's discipline, that's one thing. Not like, yeah. but discipline. Yes, ma'am. That's a different thing. But my God, yes, y'all was fighting. We were fighting. I was growing. As they say, time. scrapping. Yeah, scrapping. Putting, putting oh, my we're gonna paws. Put, we're going to put the <laughs> ING on it. Scrapping. Yes, ma'am. Why? I forgot what the situation was, but she came in the room and she was arguing at me and saying things. And then she went to push me. Then I pushed her back. Mm. And then we just started, we just started fighting. But... Um, that was that was a moment that like those were the things that I regret. I'm sure you do. I definitely regret that, but I wasn't in the mental space. I didn't have the right. healing. I didn't have the tools that I needed. Right. So that was a result of us just not really knowing each other. And that's why we would continue to fight because we didn't know each other. It's two strangers right. in the house that's right. just, just only share the same I think blood. it's hard for two women to live together. Yes, <laughs> it is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's difficult, but yes. you've got to have some kind of peaceful relationship yes. with your mother, which is Absolutely. so important. So what inspired you to start the Purpose Pusher movement and how has it made an impact on the community? So I started Purpose Pusher when I was little, I would write. So I would write poetry. Mm -hmm. That's another way I would cope as well. Um, I would write poetry. I wrote a poem. Right. <laughs> Thank goodness. I wrote a poem about my mom called Clueless. Um, Ooh, tell yes. us about Clueless, <laughs> your mama. <laughs> Basically, the poem said she left me without a clue. Oh. So it was just talking about Clueless and, you know, why did she leave me? Why did she choose the streets and drugs and different things like that? Mm. So I wrote the piece, and then after that, I would always use poetry as a way to heal. It was like my pen was mm, my therapy. Yes. And I started Purpose Pusher because at first I was called Pain to Purpose. Mm -hmm. Pain to Purpose, like using my pain to feel my God-given purpose. But now purpose. you're the Purpose Pusher. Purpose I Pusher. I love that. Yes, so um, it started in the community. I went to an open mic mm -hmm. and a guy by the name of Jason Alexander, mm -hmm. he was there and he would host all these open mics in our area, Orlando area, Lakeland area, and he heard me for the first time when I did a piece Mm. called Paint to Purpose, and he said, don't stop. He said, keep going. Yes. So that's that's how I begin the um, Purpose Pusher, just going around, traveling, speaking at different events and mm -hmm. different things like that, and to start my open mic that I do now have called Pour Your Heart Out. Really? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yes, I love that. So founding Girl Code of America is such a commendable effort. What motivated you to start this organization, and what specific areas of support does it provide for teen girls? You are a busy woman. Yes, I'm busy. <laughs> I'm so busy. So with Girl Code of America, due to the things I went through 
as a team, mm -hmm. not having that support system. I see that in our community nowadays. Yes. And I see that a lot of girls, they just need someone to guide them. Yes. They need the guidance. They need the help. They need to be seen. They need to be seen. And they need yes. to be heard. heard. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes, you know, they really do go through things. They do. So with the Girl Code of America, um, our goal is to push girls in the areas of finances because our community lacks the financial literacy. Mm -hmm. So to push them in the areas of finances. Yes to push them in the areas of health and also personal development. That's wonderful. So yes, we're currently um, going throughout our community. We have different retreats yearly so the girls can come. We have different speakers come in mm -hmm. to give them information to empower them into those different areas. That's so wonderful. Yes, Thank you for the work that you're doing Thank with our youth. You. And also, I just want to talk about this book, The Heart of a Poet. <laughs> Where can we find your book? I feel so you, that I book feel is available like, right now on Amazon.com. On Amazon.com. Yes. Y'all, please check out her book on Amazon.com. Thank you so much for joining us. It's time Thank for us to you. say goodbye for now, but we will be back tomorrow for the culture. Please. Let's do this. Get out of here. Thank you, Nathaniel. Our code at the bottom of your screen. Because we got so much more exclusive content for y'all right here that's only on the Sisandra Show. We want to thank you so much for tuning in and hanging out on the beautiful Comparosa set. We want to thank you for coming and hanging out and meeting our amazing guests. So until next time, believe in yourself, love one another, and we'll be right here only on the Sisandra Show.